Hello and welcome to this exploring session looking at two more Lord Mayor's shows. Uh, this time we are looking at 1628 and 1629. Where is 1627, you ask? Well, in a moment we will find out. Um, for those who've been following uh, these various videos in the past, we have been doing uh, all the, uh, broadly speaking, extant, extant Lord Mayor shows uh, from uh, 15 85 onwards. Uh, we've looked at a few other little uh, bits and bobs uh, around uh, civic pageantry. We're going to be doing more of this. We have more Lord Mayor shows to go. Uh, this is an event that pretty much always happens on October the 29th, except if it's a Sunday, in which case it's October the 30th, um, uh, unless it's a year when it's been cancelled. Um, and it's uh, effectively a circular uh, journey from the Lord Mayor, from the Guildhall, down to the Thames, gets on a boat, goes up to Westminster, gets sworn in, comes back to uh, land near St Paul's, walks up to St Paul's and then processes along Cheapside back to the Guildhall, has a slap up meal and then heads back to Paul's for some services and then goes to bed. All along that route there is the possibility of pageants, uh, extravaganzas, uh, speeches, performance of all kinds and we're going to be going through the documents that survive that tell us a little bit about how these things are put together and today it's a bit of a double decker session because we're looking at two pageants by Thomas Decker who we have looked at in the past uh, in these uh, these Lord Mayor shows, but he's been a little busy for a while. Uh, he's been out of the picture and uh, and just uh, and just uh, you know putting his feet up and uh, and relaxing uh, while uh, we uh, we've reached this year. Um, but uh, to read through these texts in the room, we have uh, all these wonderful people who will introduce themselves. So, uh, Greg, if you could introduce yourself to the world, hi. I'm Greg, I'm from Berkshire, Stroke Stratford upon Avon, and I'm very glad that I've got the window seat on the double decker. And uh, Liza, introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Liza, uh, actor, singer, and general theatre bod in London. Uh, always try and get the front seat. I'm that annoying person, me. <laughs> front seat on the top deck, gotta be. <laughs> Oh right, uh, and Lindsay, which uh, where where are you seated on the bus? Uh, hello, Lindsay here. Um, I always go for the very back of the very top of the double decker bus because that is the best place to sit. Um, and failing that, I hang out in Norfolk. Uh, Angela, uh, to introduce yourself, add additional bus comments if you feel that you're, you're, you're up for it. Hello, I'm Angela. I'm a historian. I live in London and uh, I know it's boring, but I quite like being on the bottom of the bus. So I'm just going to be looking up at all you posh guys at the top. Uh, 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 Alex, uh, do introduce yourself. Uh, you, you do not have to continue this running bus theme. <laughs> Um, I'm Alex Scott Fairley. I'm an actor in Perthshire. I'm definitely on the top of the bus and probably at the back, waving at the wagon drivers. And uh, Tracy, uh, do introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Tracy. Um, I'm a massive Decker fan. Um, pretty ambivalent when it comes to buses. And bothered <laughs> my sister and I used to pretend we were driving a helicopter when we were kids sitting at the front top. So. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I am the replacement bus service uh, for all of our uh, Beyond Shakespeare activity. Uh, so, um, two Lord uh, Mayor shows today. Uh, we left last time in 1626. Uh, Everyone was a little uh, jaded after a year of plague when there'd been uh, a bit of a break in service on 1625 uh, because of lots of bad things happening, basically. Um, but uh, we don't go to 1627 there is a gap what happened in 1627 tracy can you tell we us? don't know <laughs> there was a show um the haberdashers it was it was um hammersley who was a haberdasher who's buried in stowe's church and under undershaft um and the, the haberdashers company records do contain all the payments and everything like that um garrett christmas who some people will know about um got 200 pounds for the pageants and the shows. And then the following year, Decker um, writes a preface, dedicates a book rather to Hugh, Hugh Hammersley and says in that dedication, that it was some joy to me to be employed 
in the presentation of your triumphs on the day of your Lordship's inauguration. So clearly what happened that year was there was no book printed. So we're, you know, we've only got what the haberdashers records can tell us, which is not particularly expansive. So we don't know how many lions, unicorns or other such uh, activities uh, might have occurred. No. So sadly, we have to jump forward in time to 1628 as we rush headlong to the end of the decade. Uh, so, Liza, um, uh, the, uh, if you could uh, read in the uh, usual fashion the opening uh, bump on the uh, the printing, uh, and you can also do Decker's uh, opening uh, oration as well, uh, dedication there. There's a, a couple of little random bits of uh, uh, sort of uh, Mart Lib 7, uh, etc. stuff. You don't need to read that. I think you can just skip those, that, those, those random words uh, that we might discuss later. Britannia's honour brightly shining in several magnificent shows or pageants to celebrate the solemnity of the Right Honourable Richard Dean at his inauguration into the mayoralty of the Honourable City of London on Wednesday, October the 29th, 1628. At the particular cost and charges of the Right Worshipful, Worthy and Ancient Society of Skinners. Uh, Mart... Ooh... This is yeah, skip that bit. Go to the next line. This is probably a quotation from, I don't know, Marshall? Uh, Marshall, the Latin poet or something? Anyway, Rursus Io Magnus Clamat Nova Troia Triumphos, uh, invented by Thomas Decker, imprinted in London by Nicholas Oakes and John Norton. To the Right Honourable Richard Dean, Lord Mayor of the most renowned city of London, and to the two worthy sheriffs, Mr. Roland Backhouse and Mr. William Acton, Honourable Praetor, Noble Consuls, you are this year the subject of my verse. In you lie hid the fires which heat my brains. To you my songs triumphant I rehearse. From you a thanks brings in a golden gains. Since you are then the glory of my muse, but you, who can, she, who can she for her patrons choose? Whilst I rest, devoted to your lordship and worships in all service, Thomas Decker. Okay, so it's Wednesday, October the 29th, 1628. We have a new uh, Lord Mayor, Richard Dean. Um, and uh, we have... Uh, uh, we have mention of two worthy sheriffs as well, uh, Roland Backhouse uh, and William Acton. Uh, so what can you tell us about Richard Dean and uh, what's his... Uh, oh, the, the Skinners. What can you tell us about the Skinners? Um, Skinners aren't one of the kind of big hitter companies, really. I hope there's no Skinners watching this. Um, they're, 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 they never seem to have very much money. Um, George Peel, if you remember, was a Skinner. Uh, Richard Dean, nothing notable about him, apart from the fact that his nephew, who was also called Richard Dean, was one of the um, Charles I regicides. There's a little factoid for you there. <clears throat> nice, nice. Uh, we're heading in that general direction, aren't we? They're, they're a kind of, you know, the sort of Presbyterian, I don't use the word Puritan, but you know what I mean, that kind of, that, that sort of wing of politics kind of family. Oh, excellent. Uh, okay, well, uh, we are going to dive into this. Uh, we've got quite a lot of uh, pros coming up. Um, I'm going to ask Alex to dive in and I'm going to ring a bell at some point and then I'll hand the baton over to Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, about the time of the extension of a Lord Mayor's power, it's for several, several little chunkettes down. Uh, but I'll, I'll ring a little bell to indicate that you can uh, you can swap. But uh, I'll uh, uh, let Alex uh, take this uh, opening bump and let's see if we get any useful data out of it. Where did we stop? <laughs> uh, after Thomas Decker, so brightly shining in several magnificent shows. Here we are. Brightly shining in several magnificent shows or pageants to celebrate the solemnity of the Right Honourable Richard Dean at his inauguration into the mayoralty of the Honourable City of London on Wednesday the 29th of October 1628. What honour can be greater to a kingdom than to have a city for beauty able to match with the fairest in the world, a city renowned abroad, admired at home, London, and her royal daughter, Westminster, are the representative body of the general state. 
for here our kings and queens keep their courts. Here are our princes, the peers, nobility, gentry, lords, spiritual and temporal, with the numerous commonalty. London in foreign countries is called the Queen of Cities and the Queen Mother over her own. She is her king's chamber royal, his golden key, his storehouse, the magazine of merchandise, the mistress of sciences, a nurse to all the shires in England. So famous she is for her buildings that Troy has leapt out of her own cinders to build her walls. So remarkable for priority and power that hers is the master wheel of the whole kingdom. As that moves, so the main engine works. London is admiral over the navy royal of cities, and as she sails, the whole fleet of them keep their course. Fully to write down all the titles, styles, and honours of this our metropolis would weary a thousand pens. Apollo shall have a new garland of bays to undertake it. As thus in state she herself is glorious, so have all our kings held it fit to make her chief ruler eminent and answerable to her greatness. The Praetorian dignity is therefore come from the ancient Romans to invest with robes of honour our Lord Mayor of London. Their consuls are our sheriffs, their senators our aldermen. The extension of a Lord Mayor's power is every year to be seen both by land and water, down as low as Lee in Essex, up as high as Staines in Middlesex, in both which places he keeps personal courts. His house is a chancery, he the chancellor to mitigate the fury of law, he the mod moderator between the griping rich and the wrangling poor. All the city orphans call him father. All the widows call him their champion. His table lies spread to courtiers and free to all gentlemen of fashion. More to proclaim his greatness, what viceroy is installed with louder popular acclamations? What deputy to his sovereign goes along with such triumphs? To behold them, Kings, queens, princes, and ambassadors from all parts of the world have with admiration rejoiced. These triumphal passages are full of magnificence for state, munificence for cost, and beneficence for doing good. For besides all the twelve companies, every one of which is a gainer by this employment, it would puzzle a good memory to reckon up all those tradesmen with other extraordinary professions which live not in the city, who get money by this action. Then by this means are every year added to those that were before three fair, spacious and palatious houses beautified, painted, and adorned. The Lord Mayor of London, like a prince, hath likewise his variety of noble recreations, as hunting, shooting, wrestling, before him, and such like. Thus having, as it were, in landship a far-off town, you, the tops only of our city buildings, and in a little picture drawn by the face of her authority, giving but a glimpse of her praetor as he passes by, let me now open a book to you of all those ceremonies which this great festival day hath provided to attend upon him and do him honour. And thus closes the opening bump. It's 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 really nicely clear. I mean, they're laying stalls uh, for what they're going to get. We're going to get... Uh, uh, these triumphal passages, they're full of magnificence for state, munificence for cost, beneficence for doing good. So, they're, you know, lovely advert there. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we cheer on our, our, the greatness of our mayor, you know, the popularly liked. Isn't that lovely? Uh, there's a lot of statements here where I, I, I just have to write in the, col in the, col uh, in the uh, margins things like, do they? And is it? Uh, interesting questions of, is, is London in foreign countries called the Queen of Cities? I, 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 I don't know. Well, I mean, obviously it should be. Yeah. <laughs> London represent. Yeah. 
Um, you know, Lord Mayor, all the city orphans call him father, all the widows call him their champion. Do they? Do they really? Uh, you know, in reality. Um, but it, 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 it paints a lovely picture and it's setting us up now for actually describing the event itself. So I'm really liking this so far. It's been a, sometimes these texts are really obscure and it's really quite difficult to decode what's going on. This one so far is really nicely clear and I'm liking that. Um, it's just, like, just the way Decker does this. Let me now open a book to you of all these ceremonies. Now that's that's just his way of involve, involving the reader is is pretty much unparalleled. I think. Mm. It, it's so refreshing, Liza. I'm I'm struck. Uh, well, I mean, in in a lot of these pageants, we've seen uh, we've seen demonstrated the, to the Lord Mayor the virtues of how he ought to be. We've seen demonstrated virtues like charity, hospitality, generosity, um, all, all that good stuff. So I think this reads like more of the same kind of prompting. Um, and of course, to a politician, to, to a political figure before they've started their term, you can, you can say anything, you can project any hopes onto that person, onto that figure. So um, I, 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 I do, you know, I, I sort of take this in, in that kind. I like the the in landscape afar off shown you the tops of our city buildings. Oh, it's uh, landscape, is it? Sorry, I don't I know. I know what that think was. It so might be from the from the Dutch, maybe. I don't know. Um, or or just a landscape. <laughs> and I thought I've no idea what that is, but I'll just read what's on the page. Mm. I do, well, it's really popular just at this point. You know, so the whole business of the Dutch landscape has become a thing. Yeah. So it's really interesting that this is a very, very kind of up-to-date, um, you know, taste um, reference. The the only part I don't get is, um, I mean, we have we have that paragraph where the triumphs justify themselves, saying, you know, yes, we spend all this money doing triumphs, but uh, professional people get paid, and it's good for the economy of the city, and then it says. Then by this means are every year added to those that were before three fair, spacious, and palatious houses, uh, beautified, painted, and adorned. And are those, I, I'm, are those real houses? Are they metaphorical houses? Are they the mayor and their two lieutenants? What? You've got it. it. It's the mayor and the sheriff's houses. Uh, um, trimmed is the word they tend to use for, for the year. Excellent. Uh, well, let's dive into some pageants. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask Greg if you could read any of the descriptive prose. Uh, you're going to dive in and out occasionally. I'll ask Angela if you can be the first uh, speaker amphitrite. Uh, Liza, if you could be the uh, bit in French and English. Uh, and I say, Greg, you might uh, you've got a bit of prose in between Angela and Liza to read and then we'll pause before we go to the second presentation so um, uh, we'll find out in a moment uh, where in the order of service this is I might throw up my little map so that you get a sense of where this is going on um, let's see how it goes Greg if you could tell us about the first show the first show is called a sea consort the first salutation being on the water is furnished with persons and properties fitting the quality of that element. An artificial rock, therefore, is quaintly contrived, on whose highest ascent sits Amphitrite, queen of the seas, habited to her state, a mantle fringed with silver crossing her body, her hair long and dishevelled, on her head a fantastic dressing made out of a fish's writhen shell interwoven with pearl. The shell is silver. On the top of it stands an artificial moving tortoise. I'm assuming that's what it is. On each side of her swim two mermaids. These two, enticed by the variety of several instruments echoing to one another, have followed the sea sovereign and wait upon her as maids of honour. Round about the rock are sea nymphs, and in places convenient for them are bestowed our three famous city, sorry, rivers, Humber, Trent and Severn. Aptly attired according to the quality of such marine persons who play upon cornets. Hail, worthy praetor, hail, grave senators. The queen of waves, leaving grey Neptune's bowers, waits here, fair lord, to serve you. Fame's report, so far as old Oceanus crystal caught, what triumphs ceremony forth would call to swell the joys of this grand festival? 
enticed me with my mermaids and a train of sea nymphs hither. Here this day shall reign pleasures in state majestic and to lend a brighter splendor to them do attend three of my noblest children, Humber, Trent and Seven, glorious maid by punishment. The silver footed Thames, my eldest son, to grace your triumphs by your barge shall run. Your fortunes led by a white handed fate up to this high fame, I congratulate. Glad am I to behold you thus set round with glories, thus with acclamations crowned, so circled and hemmed in on every side with echoing music, fishes even take pride to swim along and listen, go and take the dis dignity stays for you, whilst I make smooth way before you on this glassy floor, ushering your glad arrival to the shore. To honour's temple now you have not far, high and come back more great than yet you are. On. And so the cornets, playing one to another, they go forward. If Her Majesty be pleased on the water or land to honour these triumphs with her presence. The, this following speech in French is then delivered to her with the book of the presentations, all the cover being set thick with flowered luces in gold. Madame, voici maintenant les quatre éléments qui vous attendent pour vous faire honneur. L'eau est couverte de triomphes flottants pour danser en l'air. Et l'air est rempli de mille échos et retentit de la douce musique qui le, que le voix résonne pour attirer vos oreilles favorables à les écouter. Puis vous avez sur la terre dix mille mains qui vous applaudissent pour louer et allégresse qu'elles qu ressentent de voir votre majesté dans la ville. L'élément du feu bruit et donne votre bienvenue. Vos sujets accourent à grand foule, ravis de voir les grâces qui ont choisi le trône sur votre front. Toutes les délits d'amour se louent sur vos paupières. La rose d'Angleterre et les fleurs de l'île de France s'entrebaisent sur le vernet de vos lèvres. Soyez saine comme le printemps, glorieuse comme l'été, autant fructueuse que la vigne. Que sûreté garde et environne votre chariot le jour, et le sommet doré dresse et orne votre chambre de nuit. Vivez longuement, vivez heureuse, vivez aimée et chérie. Bonté vous garde, vertu vous couronne, et les anges vous guident. Thus English. Royal lady, behold the four elements wait upon you to do you honor. Water hath provided floating triumphs to dance in the air. In the air are a thousand echoes with music in their mouths to entice you to hear them. On the shore shall ten thousand pair of hands give you plaudits in the city. The element of fire thunders aloud your welcomes. Throngs of subjects here are glad to see the graces enthroned on your forehead, all the delicacies of love playing on your eyelids, the roses of England and the lilies of France kissing one another on your cheeks. Be you healthful as the spring, glorious as summer, fruitful as the vine. Safety run along your chariot by day, golden slumbers dress up your chamber at night. Live long, goodness guard you, live happy. Virtues crown you, live beloved, angels guide you. And thus ends the first presentation uh, on the uh, salutation. Oh, pardon me. I Just uh, sneezing recreationally there. Uh, the uh, So this is first salutation being on the water. So this is uh, coming down from the Guildhall. And uh, as they get onto barges, so this might be on a barge. Uh, it will probably get unloaded from the barge later on. Um, we've got various details. We've got a speech on the barge. And then we've got this detail here of if Her Majesty be, uh, be uh, pleased on the water or land to honour these triumphs with her presence. So have we had, I'm assuming that this is the, 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 the queen, uh, the uh, wife to the new king. 
Uh, and um, I, have we had royal presence before being referenced in any of these texts? I don't think we have, or the possibility of it happening. I Am think, I reading I that think, right? Uh, I think there was there was a slight possibility that Queen Anna would have gone to the sixteen twelve show. Um, she certainly mentioned in the company records, but this one we don't we don't know that she, she was she didn't see any of it. But the following year, apparently, King and Queen watched um, at the Westminster end. They watched what was happening on the river. So it, it might have happened then, yeah, it's possible. The presentation copy thing is really intriguing, but I don't know any more than that. I don't know whether it was actually this book that we were working from or something particularly special. Hmm. We've had, uh, you know, present, potentially presentation documents before of uh, to the mayor, um, but there's this speculatively thing, you know, we've got a bit, of, we've heard a rumour she might be coming, so we've just written this bit in just in case. Um uh other thoughts about this uh this uh, little sequence we've got um you know uh, f uh we haven't had that much that's been explicitly seen in for the and 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 uh and uh, for a, for a, uh, on this level for a while you know we we've not been inundated with mermaids and and uh, etc sea nymphs we've got personifications of various rivers um it's uh it's it's nice i mean that's not to say it wasn't there it's just we haven't necessarily always had the uh the detail, uh, Angela. Would I be right in thinking that we the the old um, guard before this used dolphins? They seem to be a, a reuse of dolphins year after year. So this looks like it's a new setup because um, I'm not sure that uh, they, this particular combination of uh, things has got come together before. But I, I missed one last week, so I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I was I was struck by the artificial rock because there's an artificial rock in Monuments of Honor, which is 1624 show. So that might have been a, a, a kind of in a fairly sort of basic prop that could be reused for lots of different contexts. Mm. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know the the base material that these pageants are on. You know, in terms of the structure, might be being reused, and then bits of it may be reused. But it's the dressing that seems to be new each time, by and large. But uh, that that might. Uh, but we may have had more of this, though we just haven't had the details. We don't always get details of what's going on in the water. Uh, we get slightly less than we do with the main pageant. Uh, Alex? Am I right in remembering that, was it Webster had Okeanos and Tethys on barges or something hmm. last week? This just seems more assured than having two people shouting from barges. <laughs> having kind of amphitrity sat on a rock is much more sort of hands out as a little mermaid than... People shouting off of barges, which is a bit sort of grim stories. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not 100% clear where this pageant is placed. Uh, you know, it's being on the water. So, it, you know, it, it, you know it's, we, we've had pageants that have been on a barge that get then placed back on land and stuff happens later on. Um, so it may still be quite shouty from a distance, it, but it might not. <laughs> OK, we need to go into the next uh, pageant, pageant number two. I'm going to ask Alex to start us off until we get to the... Uh, uh, I'm going to sort of pass the baton along a few times here. So, uh, Lindsay, when you hear the bell, uh, will we get you go from In Places Convenient. Angela, the same. Uh, these persons are adorned. So after Lindsay, when you hear the bell. Uh, Liza, if you could be the personification of London, please. And that should cover all that. So um, we'll see how uh, how this second presentation functions. I don't know where precisely it is um, in terms of things. So uh, uh, take it away, Alex, please. The second presentation, New Troy's Tree of Honor. A person in a rich Roman antique habit with an ornament of steeples, towers, and turrets on her head sits in a quaint arbor interwoven with several branches of flowers. In her left hand, she holds a golden truncheon, leaning on the ground, to show that she's a leader and conductress of a mighty people. Her right hand, thrusting through the arbor, takes hold of a tree out of which spread 12 main and goodly branches. This lady, thus sitting, represents London. The tree, guarded and supported by her, the 12 superior companies. Upon every particular branch is bestowed the arms of someone of the twelve, expressed in the true colours within a fair shield. 
the highest branch of all, as overtopping the rest at this time, bearing the arms of the Skinners in a more large and glorious escutcheon. Among the leaves in the top is a tablet in which is written in letters of gold, Vuite concordes, live in love or agree in one. Over the person representing London is likewise inscribed in golden capitals this, Me quinctus lauro perducit ad astra triumphus, each triumph crowned with bays, me to the stars does raise. In places convenient and in a triangular form under the twelve branches of the tree are seated Minerva, inventress and patroness of arts, handicrafts and trades, in ornaments proper to her quality. And not far from her is Bellona, goddess of war, in a martial habit, on her head a helm and plume, in her hands a golden spear and shield with Medusa's head. Hereby imitating that both arts and arms are in a de high degree and fullness of honour nursed up and maintained by and in the city and that either of them flourish bravely under the shadow and protection of the twelve branches shooting forth from that new Troy's tree of honour. Upon a border of flowers enclosing this tree are fitly bestowed the arms of as many of the inferior companies in less escutcheons as for the quantity of room can there be handsomely placed. Within the same border where lesser trees also grow are presented peace, religion, civil government, justice, learning, industry, and close to industry, honour. For as all these are golden columns to bear up the glories of the city, so is the city an indulgent and careful mother to bring up them to their glories. And as these twelve noble branches cover these persons, as it were with the wings of angels, so the persons watch day and night to defend the twelve branches. These persons are adorned fitting their state and condition and hold such properties in their hands as of right belong unto them. Peace hath a dove on her fist and a palm tree branch in her hand. Religion is in a white glittering robe with a coronet of stars on her hand, holding in one hand a book open, in the other a golden ladder emblem of prayer by whose steps we climb to heaven. Civil government is in a robe full of eyes and a dial in her hand to express her vigilance, for she must watch every hour and keep all eyes open, yet all little enough. Justice holds a sword. Learning, a book and a Jacob's staff. Industry, a golden hammer and a seaman's compass as taking pains to get wealth both by sea and land. Honour sits in scarlet. The person in whom is figured London is the speaker, who thus salutes his lordships. Ten thousand welcomes greet you on the shore, my long-expected praetor, Oh, before you look on others, fix your eyes on me, on me, your second mother, London, she whom all Great Britain's cities style their queen, for still I am and have her darling been. The Christian world in me reads time's best stories, and reading falls blind at my dazzling glories. But now the snow of age covers my head, as therefore you by me have been upbred, you, sir, must nurse me now. With a quick eye view then my tree of honour, branching high for hundreds of past years with twelve large stems, twelve noble companies which like twelve gems so shine, they add new sunbeams to the day. Guard all these twelve main boughs, but you must lay a soft hand on the topping branch, for there thrive the root well yourself 
grows all this year. The lesser twigs which lowly run along my tall tree's border you must shield from wrong. There the poor bee, the sweating tradesman, flies from flower to flower and home with honey hies. With me Minerva and Bellona come, for arts and arms must at your board have room. Your gates will spread the rich to entertain, but whilst the mighty ones within remain and feast, remember at the same gate stands the poor, with crying papers in their hands, to watch when justice up the glass shall turn. Let those sands run, the poor can never mourn. Place in your eyes two beacons to descry dangers far off which strike home ere they fly. Kiss peace, let order ever steer the helm. Left-handed rule a state doth overwhelm. You are your sovereign's gardener for one year. The plot of ground you're trusted with lies here, a city, and your care must all be spent to prune and dress the tree of government. Lop off disorders, factions, mutiny, and murmurations against those sit high. May your, last year, may your year's last day end as this begins, sphered in the love of noble citizens. And that's all we have for uh, the second presentation. Um, don't know precisely where this second presentation is happening. Uh, we, I'm going to say maybe it's, uh, it's at St Paul's. It's working cheap side. I don't know. We're, we'll see if there's more data. That does seem to be absent from this text as to where these things are all necessarily going. Um, but uh, maybe we'll get more on that. Uh, as we go along, uh, some lovely details that I really like, though, almost straight out of the uh, SM uh, prompt book, isn't it? So peace, half a dove. Uh, just checking, have you got your dove uh, on your fist? Uh, uh, palm tree branch in your hand. Lovely. Justice, you got your sword. Lovely. Thank you. Move on. Um, you know, it's actually such a such a pedantic, uh, but, you know, uh, pragmatic list. I really like that. Um, I think that's really nice. Uh, around which you have all this uh, more general description uh, of stuff uh, about what, what's going on here. Um, we have various things. We've had a tree before. We've had the triangular form um, uh, so that you can arrange people in a nice, neat, hierarchical way. Um, I love the way that we have the escutcheons for sort of uh, inferior companies. Um, we just throw them in. Um yeah, it's it's full of stuff, and this, I think London's speech actually ex explicates quite well the the image that we've we've got here. Actually, the speech is it all feels quite nicely tied tied together. Um, agree or disagree at your leisure. Thoughts on the room? No one wants to jump in, Liza. <laughs> well, often. Um... I remember thinking something last week about how in these pageants, text really has a, a secondary role in the pageantry. And uh, here we see text acting as, as exegesis for the, for the images. And I agree with you that it, it, to, to explicate and also adorn. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, you're right. It, it does the job well. Well done, Decker. Yes, mm. good job. Yeah, fan of this so far. Angela. Well, I was just going to say, um, I really love that line, the poor with crying papers in their hands. Um, I'm, I'm on a project to do protest music at the moment, and this is just a wonderful uh, little, little section, which is about people who have complaints to make, and then the mayor must, must run the sands of justice so that they don't mourn. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, little section. Well, yeah, I mean, there's so many nice little lines in it. You know, your your care must all be spent to prune and dress the tree of government. I mean, I, 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 I you know, that, that we we have various uh, materials that are interested in, you know, how how you run the state and uh, you know, lop off disorders, factions, mutiny, and murmurations. You know, it's all sorts of uh, garden gardening images that I really like, which are going with uh, 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 what's a, a hopefully a beautiful. A beautiful visual image. Other thoughts before we go to pageant number three? Uh, uh, Alex. Uh, it's probably a fairly banal thing to say, but obviously I, I haven't done many of these, but compared to Webster's, it's, it seems 
much more straightforward. The, the symbolism is, is clearly explicated for people who can't work it out. Whereas in Webster's, even with those Byzantine descriptions, I, I was like, who is Ahmad de what's it? And what's he doing now? <laughs> the, the images were kind of much more, seemed much more rarefied and much more, you know, even with a textual gloss, we're probably going to appeal to, to slightly more highfalutin um, crowds. Whereas like, like Liza said, this this seems very well lost. So everyone can get something from it. Um, and it just also seems more opulent than the the last one we did with the, the sheep and the sort of papier-mâché rainbow or whatever it was, just in the way it's, a, in the way it's described. Um, mm. Uh, yes, the, the the last one was much more keen on the smell of the flowers than the uh, than necessarily the images that we were getting, uh, which is an interesting thing. We're going to go to the next uh, uh, presentation, relatively short one. I'll ask Angela to read the initial um, description, and Greg, could you be the personification of fame, please? Um, I I hope you want to live forever. Uh, okay, uh, our third presentation, please, Angela. Our third presentation is called The Glory of Furs. This is a chariot triumphant, garnished with trophies of armours. It is drawn by two luzernes, the supporters of the Skinner's Arms. On the two luzernes ride two antics, who dance to a drum beating before them, there aptly placed. At the upper end of this chariot, in the most eminent seat, carrying the proportion of a throne, are advanced a Russian prince and princess, richly habited in furs to the custom of the country. Under them sits an old lord, furred up to his chin in a short cloak. By him, a lady with martin skins about her neck and her hands in a muff. Then a judge in robes furred. Then an university doctor in his robes furred. Then a frau in a short furred cassock girt to her. Then a skipper in a furred cap. In all these persons is an implication of the necessary ancient and general use of furs from the highest to the lowest. On the top of this throne at the four corners are erected the arms of the city in four pendants. On the point of the forefront, a large square banner plays with the wind, which Fame, who is in this chariot, holds in her hands as she stands upright, being the speaker. Fame's turn is now to speak. For who but Fame can with a thousand tongues abroad proclaim your this day's progress rising like the sun, which through the yearly zodiac on must run. Fame have brought hither from great Moscow's court the seven-mouthed Volga spreading the report. Two Russian princes, who to feast their eyes with the rich wonders of these rarities, ride in this glorious chariot. How amazed they look to see streets thronged and windows glazed with beauties from whose eyes such beams are sent. Here moves a second starry firmament. Much on them, startling a minute, sorry, much on them, startling admiration wins to see these brave, grave, noble citizens who are streamed in multitude yet flowing in state for all their orders are proportionate. Russia now envies London. Seeing here spent her richest furs in graceful ornament, more brave and more abounding than her own. A golden pen he earns that can make known the use of furs so great, so general. All men may these their winter armors call. The invention of warm furs, the sun did fret, for Russians leapt in these, slighted his heat, which seen his fiery steeds he drove off from thence. And so the muff has dwelt in cold air seats. What royalties and furs to emperors, kings, princes, dukes, earls in the distinguishings of all their several robes. The furs worn here above the old Roman state make ours appear. The reverend judge and all that climb the trees of sacred arts ascend to their degrees. And by the colours changed of furs unknown. What dignity each corporation puts on by furs witness these infinite eyes. Thank then the bringers of these rarities 
I wish, grave praetor, that as hand in hand, plenty and bounty bring you safe to land, so health may be chief carver at that board to which you hasten. Be as good a lord in the eyes of heaven as this day you are great. In fame's applause, hide to your honoured seat. And thus, with those lines of fame, uh, that closes. We have two lo uh, Luzerns. We have two giant cats. Um, we've been uh, uh, waiting waiting for that, them for ages. I think they were in our... Uh, uh, Lynxes, I think, are in our earliest surviving text, actually, aren't they? I think it's that 1585 we have uh, riding uh, riding on a, uh, on a Lynx. So, um, yeah, that's, that's quite a callback. Uh, we, we've had them intermittently uh, since then. Uh, we've got lots of furs. Um, I'm sure whoever's uh, wearing these costumes in the middle of uh, the end of October are quite glad that they've got these. Um, and uh, yeah, we've uh, we've got a, a, a lovely speech from from Fame. Again, no indication of precisely how this order of service functions, how uh, it's uh, where it's placed, uh, uh, where and when precisely this is happening. Uh, thoughts from the room about Fame and uh, and the other details here. Uh, Liza. Well, this bit seems kind of like, th th this bit's a commercial, basically, right? For the Guild of Skinners. It's like, you know, people who, who bought sponsorship rights for the Olympics or something. And they're, and, and they're like, oh, and by the way, furs are cool. Buy more furs. Um, and you, uh, you know, I, I do kind of like the, uh, the idea of, of, you know, Russian Russian figures all enveloped in in furry coats and hats and mm. absolutely um why not why not it's uh you know the, the, what 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 is this the civic pageantry for if not for a certain amount of propaganda um from from the high-minded propaganda to the uh, of the state to the straightforward here here's some really cool stuff that we're involved with um we're really proud of these products. We hope you are too. Um, uh, uh, Angela. Um, I know a funny story about Russians selling furs in the early modern period, mm. because we've got here a Russian prince and princess who have brought their furs from Russia. But the fact is that the Russian Tsar often did literally send off his, uh, his aristocracy and they had to make their living if they were um, ambassadors in the various their various countries. They were going out by selling furs, you know, because he had no money. He's given them nothing. So it's quite possible that you've really got Russian princes and princesses selling furs <laughs> in London. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um... It, it's true, and I wonder whether any furs sold in Britain might have been imported from Russia. I don't. Um... Yeah, they all they were. That's where they got them from. We didn't have those um, creatures mostly, apart from rabbit. You can get some good rabbit fur. <laughs> I I don't know. Were there lynxes in Scotland at this time? Um, they persisted here later than wolves because they're about they're they're about to be reintroduced. Um. But they, they, they're also indigenous to the Iberian Peninsula, so they wouldn't necessarily have to come from Russia if it was a lynx, I suppose. Well, the link, the lynx oh, is there because they're they're part of the heraldic. Uh, I, it's not we're not nobody's wearing their fur. It's because they're heraldic figures, I think, isn't it? Mm. Uh, we've got two antics. Uh, we I haven't mentioned the antics. I don't know if we've mentioned the antics. I might have uh, missed that. Uh, who dance to a drum beating before them. So there's some dancing uh, and at least rhythmic. There's at least rhythm, if not uh, uh, a more explicit music. Um, OK, we're going to go to the next uh, presentation. I'm going to ask Liza and Lindsay. Um, I'm just going to let you yeah, t t pass the baton because there's lots of short uh bits here uh, just sort of uh, in the description how it's laid out so i'll let liza start Lindsay. uh i'll randomly ring the bell about halfway through i'm not going to give i have no idea when that's going to happen uh and then alex if you could be britannia if you could be britannia uh coming up and on so the fourth presentation liza take it away please the fourth presentation is called britannia's watchtower this is a magnificent structure advancing itself from the platform or groundwork upward with the beauty of eight antique terms by whose strength is supported a four square building. 
the top of which is a watchtower or lantern with eight columns of silver. And on the highest point of this watchtower is advanced a banner bearing the colors of the kingdom. At four corners of the upper square stand four pendants in which are the arms of the four companies of which his lordship is free. At each end of this platform stands a great Corinthian brazen pillar on a pedestal of marble. On the capitals of these pillars stand two angels in postures ready to fly, holding garlands of victory in one hand, stuck with white and red roses, and branches of palm in the other. The capitals and bases of the pillars are gold, and are emblems of the two houses of York and Lancaster, once divided but now joined into one glorious building to support this royal kingdom and consequently this city. At night, in place of the angels, are set two great lights, and so is the watchtower at that time filled with lighted tapers. Upon the same square, in four several places, are advanced four stately pyramids, being figures of the four kingdoms embellished with escutcheons. In the upper seat of all fashioned into a throne is placed Britannia, majestically attired, fitting to her greatness. Beneath her, and round about her, are these persons. Magnanimity with a drawn sword, a shipwright with a mallet holding a scutcheon in which is drawn a ship under sail, then a person representing victory with a palm tree, providence with a trumpet ready to foresee dangers and awaken men to meet them. All these have been and still are watchtowers and lanterns in the nights of fear and trouble to guard the kingdom and in the kingdom this city. In other eminent places are seated some of those kings of England in robes ermine, whose loves and royal favours in former times were watchtowers to grace London, stuck full with the beams and lights of honours, titles, officers, magistracies and royalties, which they bestow upon her. Edward Confessor called London's chief ruler a portreeve. Richard I appointed two bailiffs over London. King John gave the city a Lord Mayor and two sheriffs. Henry III added aldermen. These were tender over the renown of the city and still heaped on her head royalties upon royalties. And albeit most of our kings have in most of all of the 12 companies entered their names, as free of the societies, thereby to royalize their brotherhoods, and that many of our kings likewise, besides princes and great personages, have been free of this company, whose names I forbear to set down, because they have in former years been fully expressed. Yet no company did ever or can hereafter receive such graces from kings as this ancient and honoured corporation of Skinners have had and still have in regard of all of our kings and princes sit in their high courts of parliament in robes ermine being the richest fur, the workmanship of which goes through the Skinners fingers wearing likewise under their crowns royal caps of honour ermine. Three such crowns being the rich arms of this company, thereby expressing as well their honour as antiquity. Britannia delivers thus much. Shall the proud wife of Neptune or shrill fame or train of aunt herself ring out your name? And I be dumb or sparing to sound high the glories of this day. No, they shall fly like soaring eagles to that curled mane, whole head my rocky bridle in does rain. The great Britannia bred you in her womb. Here then a mother's counsel. You are come aboard a goodly ship, where all your state, fame, honour, and renown embarked must wait the voyage of twelve moons, high admirable. High Admiral, you are to all that fleet which thus you call to sail in this vast ocean. Nor must you walk heartless on the hatches. There's a new state navigation to be studied now, 
with an high reared, undaunted, fixed brow. Be sure to have brave ordnance and charged well in this your ship. Trust none, for officers sell their captain's trust. Let none but your own eyes rule chart and compass. There your safety lies. Your own hands steer the helm, but strongly steer, and spite of storms be stout when you stand there. Emblem of mercy, your keen sword does sleep, but why a sword? if not to kill and keep vices like slaves in awe. Fullness of wine is a foul dropsy, that and lust entwine, pride a swollen timpani, sloth the beggar's gout, in tradesmen's hands and feet it runs about. No cure for this, oaths thick as small shot fly from children, no defence to put this by. You may, you must, I counsel not, but read a lesson of my love, by which love led I'll on, and bring you to your honoured chair, whilst Aves round about you dance in the air. And thus ends that uh, pageant, uh, which, again, it, it's continuing. The, the themes are overlapping. Um, there's a, a continuation. Uh, things are slightly different, though. It, it's frustrating that this is described as a magnificent structure. It's very, it's square. Um, you know, there are some details as to how it's it's all put together, but there's, some of the details are not necessarily enough to put all the bits uh, together. So it's slightly frustrating. Um, but we have lots and lots of bits that uh, we have lots of detail for. Um, and, and yeah, lots of little lists of the component parts. It, 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 I'm starting to get a sort of Lego set quality to some of these uh uh, how they all come together um but yeah continue a continuation of thoughts from uh, other pageants and it does feel that this is very nicely integrated um uh any thoughts on uh, on this uh uh britannia's watchtower because every everybody everybody personified is a watchtower in some way shape or form in this uh angela um tracy was mentioning that this guy or at least part of his family is definitely on the kind of like puritanical side uh, of politics. And there's a very interesting little little element here that's quite, you know, that's about manners. It's about swearing and drunkenness and things like that. And I can't remember there being that kind of like uh, very explicit moral um, tone um, before, but it's, um, it just struck me. Mm. Um yes other other thoughts um we have only one more one more bit to go uh liza i do like britannia's metaphor of the the ship of state um and and the lord mayor as the the admiral and all the skills that he has to have as the skills of, of a captain we we've we've had a watchtower we've had a tree we've had a garden and now we have a ship and uh I don't know, this kind of fits in with the four elements, right? The, the ship is water and the watchtower is fire and, and the garden is earth. I don't know what the air is. Is there air? Uh, any, anyway. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. So uh, again, we're not getting in details as to where precisely in the procession this, this all goes. The last presentation, this uh, might be uh, at the end of uh, the journey along Cheapside, it could also be uh, held back for the return to St Paul's after the uh, uh, things have got a bit darker uh, after the feast. Uh, I'm just spitballing on that point because of what it's about. Um, let's see where where this one goes. But this is the last presentation, and this is all we're going to get. Uh, so I'm going to ask Greg to read the uh, the various bits of prose. Uh, Angela, if you could be Sol. And uh, Liza, if you can reprise being London. Um, and before London speaks, there's a very brief bit of uh, Greg uh, to fill in and also Greg at the end. So you you're, you're sort of, uh, we start with Greg. We, we meet, uh, very briefly meet uh, Greg in the middle and then Greg closes everything off. Uh, so can we have the last presentation, please? The last presentation is called The Sun's Bower. The upper part of this is adorned with several flowers, which interwoven together dress up a comely green arbour in which the sun sits, with golden beams about his face, 
and attire glittering like gold, and a mantle bright as his garment, fringed with gold, his hair curled and yellow. About him are placed spring, summer, autumn, and winter in proper habiliments. Beneath these is a wilderness in which are many sorts of such beasts, whose rich skins serve for furs, as the bear, wolf, leopard, luzerne, catamountain, foxes, sables, conies, ferrets, squirrels, and etc. Of these beasts, some are climbing, some standing, some grinning with lively natural postures. In a scroll hanging on a bough, this is written in capital letters. Deus ecce fiorentibus obstat. See, for all some beasts are fell. There's one that can their cursedness quell. Heaven's bright oriental gates I oped this morn, and hither wheeled my chariot to adorn these splendours with my beams. Ne'er did the sun in his celestial circle faster run than now to see these sights. Oh, how I joy to view a kingdom and a new built Troy, so flourishing, so full, so fair, so dear to the gods. They leave love's court to revel here. All o'er the world I travel in one day, yet often forced to leave my beaten way, frightened with uproars, battles, massacres, famines, and all that hellish brood of wars. I meet no peace but here, O oh blessed land, that sees fires kindling round, and yet can't, can't stand unburnt for all their flames. O oh nation blessed, when all thy neighbours shriek, none wound thy breast. To crown these joys with me are come along the four lords of the year, who by a strong knit charm bring in this goodly Russian prize as earnest of a more rich merchandise. Half of our race, time and my hours have run, nor shall they give o'er till the goal be won. <clears throat> the sun at night being covered with a veil of darkness, the person representing London thus takes leave. The sun is mantled in thick clouds of black, and by his hidden beams threatens the rack of all these glories. Every pleasure dies when raven-winged night from her cave flies. None but these artificial stars keep fire to light you home. These burn with a desire to lengthen your brave triumphs. But their heat must cool and die at length, though ne'er so great. Peace therefore guide you on, rest charm your eyes, and honours wait to cheer you when you rise. Let it be no ostentation in me, the inventor, to speak thus much in praise of the works, that for many years none have been able to match them for curiosity, they are not vast, but neat, and comprehend as much art for architecture as can be bestowed upon such little bodies, the commendations of which must live upon Mr. Gerard Christmas, the father, and Mr. John Christmas, the son. Finis. And that closes it. And we've had in previous pageants um, things about veiling or covering things before haven't we you know the the clouds or smoke or or or, or, or type things so i'm I, i'm wondering if this whole thing of the the sun at night being covered with the veil of darkness could just be you know it's night now um but as we have a literal personification of of soul um that maybe there's a there is some sort of mechanical thing going on here i don't know thoughts uh, thoughts about uh, what's what's going on here lovely list of uh, of animals um uh, various skins that are available uh gift shop on your way out uh, i i sincerely hope they all had googly eyes yeah googly eyes yeah absolutely that's what they had I, I, I phoned in and checked uh, that's 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 the spec um uh, alex you were waving. So, yes, yes. Sorry, you did a I, weird double I, take when I said your name. <laughs> it's because I've muted myself because I work off two separate keyboards for this, so I get confused as to which one I press. Because um, obviously I was slightly obsessed with the flowers last time, how you could force a flower in October where they were artificial. This is, is this presumably taxidermy, like in all seriousness, like sans googly eyes, but are these taxidermied? 
stuffed animals, basically, along the lines that you would have them today. They, they might be, but to be viewable, they might also have to be larger than life. So they might be made of, of I don't know, paper mache or, or right. plaster or something. Or, or they squirrel. could have killed so many more animals per animal <laughs> than there is for one animal. Uh, that's bringing us back to the mask. Uh, mask all, all the animals were members of equity and were fairly paid. Yeah, um, I mean, the mask of uh, cats, which is a, a mask from uh, the... Uh, from uh, Edward, um, uh, I believe they they utilise the, the the fur from uh, three hundred and sixty cats. Um, oh my God! They used real cat fur. I, oh. I, well, that's what's that's what the accounts allege. Do the I people mean... who made that film know about this? <laughs> But anyway, that's that was that was in the past. That's you know seventy years or so earlier than this. So you know you can ignore. It. Don't worry. That there's such barbaric times. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's uh, by the by. Um, other thoughts uh, before we close and move into the next the next year. Uh, Lindsay. Yes, just I mean a really general um, point, but it I just feel that this has. Um, it, it just has a kind of it's got more energy about it somehow than uh the last one that we that we read and and i understand why that one was maybe muted a bit because of the play gear preceding it and that kind of thing i don't know this just seems to have um it's just got some kind of spark in the language that i i'm really responding to yeah i mean it's interesting the 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 Lord Mayor shows seem to have got quite systematized over the last uh, sort of decade or so. That you know, Middleton's out with their they're they're quite similar, um, uh, but not as focused. And this this just seems to have a, a sense, even though it's relatively simple. That that what we've got here, in the sense we've got five pageants, uh, you know, uh, no other details, um, nice speeches for each. So in a sense, on a surface level, they're very similar to what Middleton, uh, for example, was doing. Um, but you're right, it just seems to have a, a, a much uh, brighter energy to it. Um, uh, other thoughts? I think we may have lost Tracy. I think uh, Tracy's been having some connectivity issues. Uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, going to see where we are. Any thoughts uh, before we go on to the next one uh, to see where we are? Okay, just going to pause. Wow, suddenly we've all moved slightly and Liza's holding a cat. Uh, that's because we briefly paused. Uh, I, that's because a second ago I said, I'm going to pause now, and then we paused. Um, we've sadly lost Tracy for the rest of the session. Uh, hopefully, maybe she'll uh, manage to uh, fight her way back. If not, we might uh, restage elements of this further down the line to uh, get uh, Tracy's thoughts on what's going on here. Uh, but we are jumping forward to the next year, 1629. Uh, so... Uh, Liza, if you could read the opening month and uh, dedication by Thomas Decker, please, to get us into what's happening on... Th it's a Thursday. We, we oh. were in a Wednesday. We're now on a Thursday. Okay. Can someone with better Latin than me tell me if the first, if the second word is temple or tempe? Is it, mm. is it a, like Latin for a, a field or something? I... Uh... I'd go tempe, but that's me. I've just got tempe. Yeah, so I think that's Latin. Um, okay, well, presumably they don't mean tofu. Okay. <laughs> this um, is what happens when you lose your uh, your house expert because of Wi-Fi issues. We're all stumbling in the dark now. Um, okay, Liza. Um, they're, they're, sorry, I did a hasty... Uh, the Veil of Tempe was cut through the rocks by the trident of Poseidon. Um, so it Marvelous. possibly ties to... It was home for a time to Aristeus, son of Apollo and Cyrene, who was the one that chased Eurydice into the into the underworld so that's I don't know if that's Galawag. useful but it, it's very useful uh, wonderful yes good to know excellent london's tempe or the field of happiness in which field are planted several trees of magnificence state and beauty to celebrate the solemnity of the right honorable james campbell at his inauguration into the honorable office of praetorship or mayoralty of london on thursday the 29th of october 1629 all the particular inventions for the pageants, shows of triumph, both by water and land, being here fully set down at the sole cost and liberal charges of the Right Worshipful Society of Ironmongers, written by Thomas Decker. 
Quando magis dignos liquuit spectare triumphus. To the right honorable James Campbell, Lord Mayor of the most renowned city of London. Honorable Praetor, the triumphs which these few leaves of paper present to your view, albeit their glories are but short-lived as glittering only for a day, boldly show their faces unto the eye of the world, as servants attending on your lordship only to do you honor. With much care, cost, and curiosity are they brought forth, and with exceeding greatness of love, a free-handed bounty of their purse, a noble and generous alacrity of spirit, have your worthy fraternity and much to be honored brotherhood of ironmongers bestowed them upon you. It much wins upon them to have such a chief, and you cannot but be glad to have such a society. By a free election are you London's praetor. The suffrages of commoners call you to your seat. A succession to the place takes you by the hand. Your industry hath met with blessings. Those blessings given you ability, and that ability makes you fit for a magistrate. Yet there is a music in your own bosom whose strings being touched yields as harmonious a sound to you as all these, and that is to see yourself here to that patrician dignity with which your father was invested. It was an honor to him to wear that robe of scarlet. It is a double glory to you in so short an age to have his sword borne before you. You have the voice of senators breathing out your welcome, a confluence of grave citizens adding state to your state, the acclamations of people ushering you along, whilst I, the least part of this triumphant day, spend such sand as I have to help fill up the hourglass, my service running, attending on your lordship, Thomas Decker. And there we uh, pause. Uh, I have no immediate data on uh, the Right Honourable James Campbell. Uh, we have encountered the Ironmongers before. Um, uh, well, we've encountered almost everybody before at some point. Uh, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a little while. It's been a little over 10 years, I think, since we've last had the, the Ironmongers. Last time was uh, a Monday uh, in... Uh, in uh, uh, oh, and what is uh, 1618? Uh, Greg has uh, perhaps found some things. I've unearthed. I, this was only because I vaguely remember Tracy saying this a while back. His father was Lord Mayor in 1609. Ah. Uh, so, um, yes, apart from that, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but certainly he was, that was an interesting link back. Mm, yes, and we've done the 1609 um, a pageant uh, as, as a, a reading in the theatre. That's Campbell or the Ironmonger's Fair Field. Oh, so um, there's uh, there's some uh, things. Uh, a little bit of uh, trivia that I, uh, I uh, dug out of uh, Tracy in Absence is only available now in book form. Uh, so I've been frantically uh, re uh, flicking through this uh, while uh, you're reading that. Uh, so um, broadly speaking, you... Um, uh, the 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 artificers and uh, uh, writers of these uh, sort of pitch to the uh, the uh, uh, to a committee uh, uh, etc uh, the 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 costings and the the show they want to produce and uh, they wanted two hundred quid and uh, they they were negotiated down to one hundred and eighty so uh, the initial pitch was uh, was pushed down a bit uh, but apparently there were some cost rises because uh, some of the musicians wanted more money. Because that never happens. Uh, Go musicians! Damn, they always have a better union than us. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, any thoughts on uh, on uh, that sort of opening bump uh, there and uh, that opening material before we move forward? Okay, I'm going to ask Alex to read the next sort of introductory material. There's quite a lot of it. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna lay that all on you before we go to the the first pageant. Alex, uh, give us uh, tell us what what comes next. Were it possible for a man in the compass of a day to behold as the sun does all the cities in the world, as if he went with walking beams about him, that man should never see in any part of the year any city so magnificently adorned with all sorts of triumphs, variety of music, of bravery, of beauty, of feastings, of civil yet rich ceremonies, 
with gallant lords and ladies and throngs of people as London is rich with. On the first day that her great lord, or Lord Mayor, for it is all one, takes that office upon him. In former ages, he was not encompassed with such glories. No such firmaments of stars were to be seen in Cheapside. Thames drank no such costly healths to London as he does now. But as Troy Novalt spread in fame, so our English kings shined upon her with favours. In those homespun times, they had no collars of SS, no mace, sword, nor cap of maintenance. These came by degrees as aditamenta honoris, additions or ensigns of more honour, conferred by several princes on this city. For in the time of Edward Confessor, the chief ruler of the city was called Reeve, Grieve, or Port Reeve, the next to him in authority, Provost. Then in the first of Richard I, two bailiffs carried the sway. This continued till the ninth of King John, who by letters patents gave the citizens power yearly to choose themselves a Lord Mayor and two sheriffs. Then King Henry III made the first aldermen in London, yet the name of Ealdorman was known in the Saxons' time, for Alwyn, in the reign of Edgar, was alderman of all England, that is to say, Chief Justice, and those aldermen of London had ruled then, as now, over the wards of the city, but were every year changed, as the sheriffs are in these days. Then Edward I ordained that the Lord Mayor should, in the King's absence, sit in all places within London as Chief Justice, and that every alderman that had been Lord Mayor should be a Justice of Peace for London and Middlesex all his life after. Then, in the reign of Henry VII, Sir John Shaw Goldsmith, being Lord Mayor, caused the alderman to ride from the Guildhall to the waterside, when he went to take his oath at Westminster, where before they rode by land thither, and at his return to ride again to the Guildhall there to dine, all the kitchens and other offices there being built by him, since which time the feast has there been kept, for before it was either at Grocer's Hall or the Merchant Tailor's. Thus small roots grow in time to cedars, shallow streams to rivers, and a hand of government to be the strongest arm in a kingdom. Thus you see London in her mean attire, then in robes majestical, and sitting in that pomp, cast your eye upon those alluring objects which she herself beholds with admiration. So, a bit of a, a, a potted uh, history, similar to some of the potted uh, material that we had last time. Um, a sort of throat clearing from this document. Um, uh, yeah, uh, any any brief thoughts on this? Say, so, uh, we, we can get a certain sense of repetition, uh, a sense, sense of deja vu when you do more than one in a row. Um, uh, we're, we're playing a similar sort of uh, game with uh, with history and uh, precedents for uh, how things came to be as they are now. Otherwise, we'll dive into some pageants relatively swiftly. Uh, so I'm going to ask Lindsay to read the prose uh, information on the first pageant. Greg, if you could be Oceanus, please. Uh, Angela, if you could read the second presentation, Alex to read the third, and uh, we'll come back around, uh, pause before we get to the fourth, but these are relatively short, so uh, let's get through uh, a little selectionette. So, Lindsay, if you could start us off, please, with the first. The first scene is a waterwork presented by Oceanus, King of the Sea, from whose name the universal main sea is called the Ocean. He, to celebrate the ceremonies and honours due to this great festival, and to show the world his marine chariot, sits triumphantly in the vast but quaint shell of a silver scallop, reigning in the heads of two wild seahorses, proportioned to the life, their manes falling about their necks, shining with curls of gold. On his head, which, as his beard is knotted, long, carelessly spread and white, is placed a diadem, whose bottom is a conceited coronet of gold. The middle over that is a coronet of silver scallops, and on the top, a fair spreading branch of coral, interwoven thickly with pearl. In his right hand, a golden trident, 
or three forked scepter. His habit is antique, the stuff, watch it, and silver, a mantle crossing his body with silver waves, bases and buskins cut likewise at the top into silver scallops. And in this language, he congratulates his lordship. Thus mounted, hither comes the king of waves, whose voice charms roughest billows into slaves, whose foot treads down their necks with as much ease as in my shelly couch I rein up these. Loud echoes called me from my glittering throne to see the noble Temesis, a son to this my queen and me, Tethys, whose ear ne'er lo up, leveled up such music as sounds here, for our unfathomed world roars out with none but horrid sea fights, navies overthrown, hands half drowned in blood, pirates pell-mell, Turks slavish tugging oars, the Dunkirk's hell, the Dutchman's thunder and the Spaniard's lightning, to whom the sulphurous breath gives heat and heightening. Oh, these are the dire tunes my consort sings, but here old Thames outshines the beams of kings. This city adds new glories to Jove's court, and to all you who to have to this Sorry. And to all you, to this hall resort, this lactea via as a path is given, being paved with pearl as that with stars in heaven. I could to swell my train, beacon the rhyme, but the wild boar has tusked, tusked up his vine. I could swift vulgar call, whose curled head lies on seven rich pillows, but in merchandise the Russian him employs. I could to Theus call Ganges, Nilus, long-haired Euphrates, Tagus' gold, golden hands clasp Lisbon walls. Him could I call too. But what need this call? Were they all here, they would weep out their eyes, mad that new Troy's high towers on tiptoe rise to hit heaven's roof. Mad to see Thames this day for all his age in wanting and windings play before his new grave praetor and before these great senators, best fathers of the poor. That grand canal where stately once a year a fleet of bridal gondolettes appear to marry with a golden ring that's hurled into the sea. That minion of the world, Venice to Neptune, a poor land scrip is to these full braveries of Tempsis. Go therefore up to Caesar's court and claim what honours these are left to Campbell's name, as by descent whilst we tow up a tide, which our run sweet sweating up by your barge's side. That done, time shall call Oceanus's name in roll for guarding you to London's capital. And the second presentation. The invention is a proud swelling sea on whose waves is borne up the sea lion as a proper and eminent body to marshal in the following, following triumphs. In regard, it is one of the supporters of the East Indian Company of which his Lordship is free and a great adventurer. And these marine creatures are the more fitly employed in regard also that his lordship is mayor of the staple, governor of the French company and free of the Eastland company. On this lion, which is cut out of wood to the life, rides Tethys, wife to Oceanus and queen of the sea. For why should the king of waves be in such a glorious progress without his queen or she without him? They both therefore twin themselves together to heighten these solemnities. Her hair is long and dishevelled. On her head, an antique sea tire encompassed with a coronal of gold and pearl. Her garments rich and proper to her quality with a taffety mantle fringed with silver crossing her body. Her right hand supporting a large streamer in which are the Lord Mayor's arms. On each side of this lion attend a mermaid and merman 
holding two banners with the arms of the two new shreves, several fishes swimming, as it were, about the border. And these two, having dispatched on the water, hastened to advance themselves to the land. And the third pageant, please. The third show is an ostrich cut out of timber to the life, biting a horseshoe. On this bird rides an Indian boy, holding in one hand a long tobacco pipe, in the other a dart. His attire is proper to the country. At the four angels of the square where the ostrich stands are placed a Turk and a Persian, a pikeman and a musketeer. And so, yes, we'll pause there on the third. We're halfway through the available uh, presentations um, and we're getting a lot more uh, material here that uh, touches on various issues that we've touched on on some of the other uh, pageants that we've done in the past. Um, we, we've, we've met Oceanus uh, a few times, I think. Uh, I did a quick search for his name and uh, brought up quite a few uh, uh, earlier um uh, possible references in uh, in uh, so it may have been the speaking part i seem to recall him definitely saying something earlier um so the fir- that he's the the central part of the first presentation the second one uh featuring t- uh, wife to oceanus uh, tethys uh, on a sea lion um and we have a mermaid and a merman uh with banners etc um uh, but uh, uh that's all uh, in re- reference in regard it's one of the supporters of the east indian company uh and then the third we have some uh slightly problematic representations of an indian boy um uh and uh, we have turks and persians and pikemen but we have no speeches for the second or third presentations they seem to be following uh, sort of part of that first presentation so the first presentation is the big show and maybe these are sort of accompanying things that are sort of sauntering along with them i'm i'm talking out loud feel free to throw something in thoughts um especially uh, uh any anything from the room um and uh lindsay sorry Yes, I'm sort of tentatively putting my hand up because I, I all along, I've been waiting for the ironmonger's equivalent of all the endless fur that we had in the in the Skinner's pageant. And um, I, I don't know that we've that we've had it yet. I was expecting all kinds of wrought iron marvels to be on display or something like that. Um, or whatever they would do, I don't know. But I don't think we've really had that. We've had a lot of marine glory, which is lovely and glorious. Um, so, but I'm just wondering where the um, where the direct connection with the iron ironmongers is. I'm just I'm- wondering if it's to do with their trading relations that they're talking about. We're trading with all of these far off places. That mm. seems, I think, to be the thrust, and we've had that before in other pageants and for other uh, livery companies. I I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, precisely how that that that's all supposed to uh, function, but that's possibly it. It doesn't feel like we've got quite as much of the uh, uh, of the sort of togetherness of we had the, with the last text, where I felt very comfortable as to what's going on. Um, yeah, you, the so, med- uh, Eliza Sorry. then Angela. I, I I totally didn't mean to talk over you, Angela. I uh, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, well, well, you're. I, I was just going to say you're right that the metaphor doesn't seem as clear as the as the last one. I I guess uh, they have to. May, maybe they have to have some exotica. Maybe the the Christmas the the Christmas family um, who seem to be pretty firmly established as designers at this point. Uh, may, uh, maybe maybe they insisted on it, or they just had the costumes and they're like, right, we're putting these people on this pageant and riding an ostrich. Definitely ostrich. Look, look I've got a lovely ostrich right here. An um, ostrich cut out of timber to the life. Uh, to the so, life. To the life. Uh, so that's a, 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 a timber timber structure on some some level. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's something. I think it is something to do with the sort of uh, the merchant adventurous uh, sort of side of uh, what these people are doing. I think, but I could be very wrong. Uh, Angela, you wanted to say something. Uh, I was just going to say we were speculating um, in the last one 
that uh, there was lots of taxi driving, whereas here we're told very specifically that you want that cut out. Uh, you're oh. really fading out. I'm, we're losing your volume. Um, I, I don't know what's what's happened there. Um, Can you hear me now? No, you've you've almost completely disappeared. You you just you you were a bit quiet earlier, and now you're getting quieter and quieter. What about that? Can you hear me now? Just. Oh, wow. how funny! I don't know why that is. Yeah. Okay, well, I was just saying that we were speculating that uh, in the last one that there were loads of um, taxidermy animals, whereas this time we've been absolutely. Um, told that they are cutouts, so let's hope that's true of last year as well. Mm. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, let us gather more data. Again, we don't know where precisely all these things are happening. Uh, maybe the first presentation was also a water, uh, the water referency, but also perhaps was on the water, but we have no data. Um, so we're going to go forward. I'll ask Greg to begin uh, with the, uh, the description. Liza, if you could read the song that comes up next. Um, Greg to continue the description. And then I'll ask Alex if you can be uh, Jove. And Lindsay if you can be Volcana. Um, and we'll see how that, uh, that all goes. Um, so the fourth presentation, please. Fourth presentation is called the Lemnian Forge. In it are Vulcan, the smith of Lemnos, with his servants, the Cyclope, whose names are Pyrocomon, Brontes, and Scarapes, working at the anvil. Their habits are waistcoats and leather aprons, their hair black and shaggy in knotted curls. A fire is seen in the forge, bellows blowing, some firing, some at other works, thunder and lightning on occasion. As the smiths are at work, they sing in praise of iron, the anvil and hammer, by the concordant strokes and sounds of which Tubal Cain became the first inventor of music. The song. Brave iron, brave hammer, from your sound, the art of music has her ground. On the anvil thou keep'st time, thy nick a knock is a smith's best chime. Yet thwick a thwack, Thwick a thwack, 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 make our brawny sinews crack, then pit a pat, pat, pit a pat, pat, till thickest bars be beaten flat. We shoe the horses of the sun, harness the dragons of the moon, forge Cupid's quiver, bow, and arrows, and our dame's coach that's drawn with sparrows, till thwick a thwack, etc., etc. Jove's roaring cannons and his rammers we beat out with our Lemnian hammers. Mars his gauntlet helm and spear and Gorgon shield are all made here. Uh, the grate which shut the day out bars, those golden studs which nail the stars, the globe's case and the axle tree, who can hammer these but we? A warming pan to heat earth's bed, lying in the frozen zone half dead. Hobnails to serve the man in the moon, and sparrow bills to clout pan's shoon, whose work but ours till thwicka thwack, etc. Venus kettles, pots, and pans we make, or else she brawls and bans. Tongues, shovels, and irons have their places, else she scratches all our faces. Till thwick a thwack, thwick thwick a thwack thwack, make our brawny sinews crack, then pit a pat pat, pit a pat pat, till thickest bars be beaten flat. Shave and a haircut, two bits. Two <laughs> bits sits in one place of this forge, on his head a curled yellow hair, his eyes hidden in a lawn, a bow and quiver, his armour. Wings at his back, his body in light colours, a changeable silk mantle crossing it. Golden and silver arrows are ever and anon reached up to him, which he shoots upward into the air, and is still supplied with more from the forge. On the top sits Jove, in a rich antique habit, a long white reverend hair on his head, a beard long and curled, a mace of triple fire in his hand burning, who calling to Vulcan, this language passes between them. Oh, Vulcan. Stop your hammers. What ails, Jove? We are making arrows for my slipstring son. Here, 
Reach him those two dozen. I must now a golden handle make for my wife's fan. Work, my fine smuggers. First here, you shall not play. The fates would scold should you keep holiday. What then? Command thy brawny fisted slaves to sweat at the anvil and to dust their hammers beat, to stuff with thunderbolts Jove's armories, for vices mountain-like in black heaps rise, my sinews crack to fell them, idiot pride stalks upon stilts ambition by her side, climbing to catch stars breaks her neck in the fall, the gallant roars, roarers drink oaths and gall, the beggar curses, avarice eats gold, Yet ne'er is filled, learning's a wrangling scold, War has a fatal hand, peace whorish eyes. Shall not Jove beat down such impieties? It's not high time, it's not true justice then, Vulcan, for thee and thy tough hammer men, To heat thy anvil, and blow fires to flames, To burn these broods who kill even with their names. Yes, Jove, tis more than time. And what helps this but iron? Oh, then how high shall this great Troy text up the memory of you, her noble praetor, and all those, your worthy brotherhood, through whose care goes that rare, rich prize of iron to the whole land. Iron, far more worth than Tagus's golden sand. Iron, best of metals, pride of minerals, heart of the earth, hand of the world, which falls heavy when it strikes home. By iron strong charms, riots lie bound. War stops her rough alarms. Iron, earthquake strikes in foes, knits friends in love. Iron's that main hinge on which the world doth move. No kingdom's globe can turn, even smooth and round, but that his axle tree in iron is found. For armies wanting iron are puffs of wind, and but for iron, who thrones of peace would mind? Were there no gold nor silver in the land, yet navigation which on iron does stand could fetch it in, gold's darling to the sun, but iron, his hardy boy by whom is done more than the t'other dare, the merchant's gates by iron bar out thievish assassinates. Iron is the shopkeeper's both lock and key, what are your cores of guard when iron's away? How would the corn prick up her golden ears? But that iron ploughshares all the labour bears in earth's strange midwifery. Brave iron, what praise deserves it? More tis beat, more it obeys. The more it suffers, more it smooths offence. In drudgery it shines with patience. This fellowship was then, with judging eyes, united to the twelve great companies, it being far more worthy than to fill a file inferior. Yon's the sun's gilt hill. On toots love guards you on, Cyclops a ring. Make with your hammers to whose music sing. So much really great stuff here. Um, iron, iron, buy its great stuff. Look at what this wonderful iron can do for you. Have you bought iron recently? Here is all the things that iron is. It's it's so versatile as a metal. Um, and that song, uh, Lisa, I, I, I loved your uh, uh, thwick, thwick, thwack, thwack, thwick. Um, yeah, it really made that come alive. That that this whole little section I've just got. This is a keeper. Yeah, love this. This is a little thing. Uh, we could put this in a live show as just a random Ironmongers advert. Um, sometimes these Lord Mayor shows are actually too circumspect in how they're selling their own companies. Uh, whereas this one is just clearly not. It's just going. <laughs> isn't Iron fantastic? <laughs> um. Any additional thoughts on uh, on? Yeah, I thought there would be Lindsay. Yeah, then, no, Alex. just very quickly. This is obviously what I was talking about. Something like this um, before we got to the section. I was like, "What? Why aren't they bigging up the whole iron thing?" You know, and then they did. So I just had to be more patient. That was all. Like, that's it. <laughs> uh, Alex, and sort of bizarre sidebar for people who have really niche interests. <laughs> It reminded me really strongly, there's a there's a very early Cole Porter show called The New Yorkers, which is the show that Love the Sale comes from. And act one ends with a song called Wood that has nothing to do with the plot, but repeats the line wood 
over and over again. They bring the piano out of the pit. They bring the cello on. Wood built the American states because it's what the pilgrims came over in. It's extraordinary. And on the on the modern recording that they did in the studio, someone actually says, this is how the actual first act ended. <laughs> um, it just reminded me so strongly of that, just an iron version. Yeah. But it's brilliant. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's a total audition speech. So, yeah. Mm. OK, uh, we've we found a bit that we, we, we can use elsewhere. Uh, it's, uh, that, that often these, these things are super specific and, uh, and things. But uh, yeah, absolutely loving this. Um, we have two more um, presentations. We have a fifth and we have the sixth and last presentation. We can probably assume that last presentation might be something uh, happening more at night um, or it may be detached from the speech at night that is uh, given at the Lordship at his gate, which is mentioned at the very, very end. I'll ask Angela, hopefully we'll be able to hear. Uh, I, I don't, don't know what's going on there. But I'll ask you to read the first bit of prose. Uh, Alex, if you could be Titan coming up. Um, then Liza, if you can read the uh, the prose beginning the sixth and last presentation. Uh, Lindsay, I'll ask you to be Apollo. Uh, and Greg, if you can reprise Oceanus, I think you were Oceanus earlier, and I'll close the whole thing off. So hopefully we'll be able to hear Angela as we go into the fifth uh, presentation. The fifth presentation is called London's Tempe, or the Field of Happiness, thereby reflecting upon the name of Campbell, or Le Beauchamp, a fair and glorious field. It is an arbour, supported by four great terms. On the four angles or corners over the terms are placed four pendants with arms in them. It is roundabout furnished with trees and flowers, the upper part with several fruits, intimating that as London is the best stored garden in the kingdom for plants, herbs, flowers, roots, and such like. So on this day, it is the most glorious city in the Christian world. And therefore, Titan, one of the names of the sun, in all his splendor with Flora, Ceres, Pomona, Ver, and Estas are seated in this tempe. On the top of all stands a lion's head, being the Lord Mayor's crest. Titan, being the speaker, does in this language court his lordship to attention. Welcome, great Praetor. Now hear Titan speak, whose beams to crown this day through clouds thus break. My coach of beaten gold is set aside, my horses to ambrosial mangers tied. Why is this done? Why leave I mine own sphere, but here to circle you for a whole year? Embrace then Titan's counsel, now so guide the chariot of your sway in a just pace, that all to come hereafter may with pride say none like you did noblier quit the place. Lower than now you are in fame, never fall. Note me, the sun, who in my noon career renders a shadow, short or none at all, and so, since honor's zodiac is your sphere, a shrub to you must be the tallest pine. On poor and rich, you equally must shine. This if you do, my arms shall ever spread about those rooms you feasted. From her head, Flora, her garlands pluck, being queen of flowers, to dress your parlors up like summer bowers. Ceres, lay golden sheaths on your full board, with fruit you from Pomona shall be stored whilst Ver and Estus, spring and summer, drive from this your tempe winter, till he dive in the frozen zone, and Titan's radiant shield guard Campbell's Beauchamp, London's fairest field. And we move into the sixth and last presentation. The sixth and last presentation. This is called Apollo's Palace because seven persons representing the seven liberal sciences are richly enthroned in this city. Those seven are in loose robes of several colors with mantles according and holding in their hands escutcheons with emblems in them proper to everyone's quality. The body of this work is supported by 12 silver columns. At the four angles of it, four pendants play with the wind. On the top is erected a square tower supported by four golden columns. In every square is presented the embossed antique head of an emperor, figuring the four monarchs of the world, and in them pointing at four kingdoms. Apollo, 
is the chief person. On his head a garland of bays, in his hand a lute. Some hypercritical censurer, perhaps, will ask why, having Titan, I should bring in Apollo, Sithenth. They both are names proper to the sun. But the youngest novice in poetry can answer for me that the sun, when he shines in heaven, is called Titan, but being on earth, as he is here, we call him Apollo. Thus, therefore, Apollo tunes his voice. Apollo never stuck in admiration till now. My Delphos is removed the hither. My oracles are spoken here. Here the sages utter their wisdom. Here the sibyls their divine verses. I see senators this day in scarlet riding to the capital, and tomorrow the same men riding up and down the field in armors gowned citizens and warlike gownmen. The gun here gives place, and the gown takes the upper hand. The gown and the gun march in one file together. Happy king that has such happy people, happy land in such a king, happy praetor so graced with honours, happy senators so obeyed by citizens, and happy citizens that can command such triumphs. Go on in your full glories, whilst Apollo and these mistresses of the learned sciences waft you to that honourable shore, with a time bids you hasten to arrive. And now a speech at night at uh, taken leave of his uh, lordship at his gate uh, by Oceanus, uh, visiting uh, the lord as he wants to go to bed. After the glorious troubles of this day, night bids you welcome home. Night, who does lay or pomp or triumphs by state, now defends. Here on our officious train their service ends, and yet not for, and yet not all foresee. The golden sun, our bite, he has his day's work fully done, sits up above his hour and does his best to keep the stars from lighting you to rest. Him will I take along to lay his head in Tess's lap. Peace therefore guard your bed. In your year's zodiac may you fairly move, shined on by angels, blessed with good men. And thus much his own worth cries up the workman, uh, Master Gerard uh, uh, Christmas, for his invention that all the pieces were exact and set forth lively with much cost. And this year gives one remarkable note to aftertimes that all the barges followed one another, every company in their degree, in a stately and majestical order. This being the invention of a noble citizen, one of the captains of the city. Ah, oh, so a little hint of something to do with the uh, uh, the barges on the water uh, as they go to uh, Westminster. Uh, that they're going in comp company order. Uh, and that this is this the first time this has happened? Uh, this is one where I really wish we had Tracy here to answer that in more detail. But that seems to be that, yeah, there's some innovation has occurred uh, here with the... Um, um, uh, uh, that this might be an innovation to uh, what's happening on the water, of which we have very little data. Um, yeah, I, I, I really want to just leap in on the uh, the Monday moment. Uh, I'm going to call it a Monday moment for those who've watched these videos before. Anthony Monday had a, a remarkable ability to jump in on a point of quibble uh, or, uh, or or something where he was in the wrong or just uh, some element of history and just go off on one. And there's just this moment of, uh, you know, uh, some uh, hyper, uh, hypercritical centre, perhaps, will ask why. Um, I think you'll find um, it should be like this. I need to put this footnote. Uh, yeah, but it's it sort of sim works as this and this and this. Now go away. Um, quality to it. So I quite like that. It was sort of, um, yeah. Um, so, yes, we've got um, Titan, a not desperately well described um, uh, field of happiness there. And then Apollo's Palace, uh, again, these structures could be reused, things that we've had before. Uh, this session has sort of dragged on a little bit um, in terms of time. Uh, any final thoughts on the end, the fifth and sixth uh, uh, presentation, and also Decker overall, uh, Liza? 
Well, the structure certainly sounds a lot like the same structure they used for the watchtower the previous year. Um, mm. Do we do we think the Christmases just uh, just recycled that? I, I'm I'm sus I, my, I'm 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 planning on going through all of these these uh, pageants at some point and just trying to figure out what superstructures they've got. If the, if we can really determine precisely what base pageant structures they they have in stock that can be reused each time, I would not be surprised. But I don't know if we have enough data to say yes, it was. But yeah, I think that's absolutely that's what I would do. The idea of building something fresh every year just seems clearly nonsense. And you know, we've we've had Merman and uh, and uh, and uh, Lazens for going on for. <laughs> and ostriches going on for you know so many shows going so far back that you know that they're refurbishing the old structure seems much more plausible i wonder whether there is a kind of base unit as it were onto yeah. which things can be fixed and fastened so this year we've got the mermen on either side and another year we've got the seahorses on a, on another side or whatever it is there's a kind of ikea like identikit element to that possibly yeah, it's like we've we've had boats uh, quite a lot, um, where the, the presumably the boat structure is the same, but they deck it with different things and they give it a different uh, look every time, and uh, that that gets used and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, I've I've I, I've not enjoyed the second decker as much as the first. There's much less here. Well, uh, I, I, there was that wonderful moment. That, that, that Vulcan love, bit is beautiful. I love the iron speech. Yeah. The irons, and, and wonderfully delivered, of course. And the song but, as well. And the song. Like, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that section there could be lifted and, you know, the rest can, can stay, stay the, put. <laughs> the fourth pageant is fabulous. Um, it's absolute. That whole, that, all of it there is absolutely lovely and, and very removable. Um, but the rest of it just is so special bars how much data we actually have here um but on the whole decker considering he's been out of circulation for a while uh taking a bit of a holiday on her uh, uh well i was going to say her majesty's service um <laughs> his majesty's service uh for a while um so uh yes uh, any other thoughts about uh, uh about these two pageants from the room before i close the session we've already run a little bit uh any any final thoughts that people want to throw in we might touch back on this final one uh, a bit in the future, just uh, so we can get a little bit of uh, more data from Tracy uh, about what's going on in this one, because I think there's a lot of backstory to this one that we've got. Uh, I touched upon neg negotiation of price and things. I suspect there's more. Uh, so I thank all the wonderful readers. Thank you very much and goodbye.